corporations claiming ownership of cancer genes aren't the only ones cashing in on the commercial potential of the disease. Every year during National Breast Cancer Awareness Month, Susan G. Komen, America's largest breast cancer organization and branding behemoth, helps to make the month of October profitable for all things pink. The organization has been at the forefront of removing the stigma and shame from speaking openly about breast cancer. But it has also opened the door for anyone to turn a profit and paint themselves with a patina of concern for women's health by painting themselves with a coat of pink. Even if only a minuscule portion of that profit goes to breast cancer research and the pink ribbon is covering up a distinct lack of love for the ladies. Take this example from Peggy Ornstein's New York Times magazine cover story where she describes one such addition to the breast cancer bandwagon writing and this blew me away the one from the website called Pornhub that would donate a penny to a breast cancer charity for every 30 views of its big or small breast videos yeah. Okay. So <laughs> that is also the ones that are they are causing environmental risks in communities right. that may lead to cancer, and they're pinkwashing as well. I yes. mean, it goes even further, even more of a direct link to cancer and pinkwashing. And and on the one hand, like this is this the the Komen is the great example of taking a disease that you know if you think about Betty Ford coming out talking about having breast cancer at a time when it was shameful and it was silenced, women dying because of that shame and silence. Coleman brings it out into the open and then even in so doing, you know, generates all of these other negative, you know, externalities. What did you think of, of Peggy Ornstein's New York Times piece, it, particularly the critiques of, of mammography that were there? Right. So I think there are two issues. One has to just do with the education and awareness and are we having an over-awareness mm. and then the pinkwashing. We, do, we see the same thing with environmental movements and greenwashing. Mm. And so just because something has a good idea doesn't mean you're not going to have people with bad intentions take advantage of that. And so we shouldn't expect that somehow the breast cancer movement would be um, isolated from the things that we're seeing. So, so that's just to be taken as a given. The other is just the idea of um, wanting to have accurate information. And so certain communities may be over-informed, um, but really the question is whether or not this is information or misinformation. Mm -hmm. And so I think that a lot of times people have different perceptions of what they're hearing, they, they may not hear it, but they're, they internalize it differently. So, for example, what I mean is that if you ask a number of women what your personal breast cancer risk is, they may say 40 percent, because uh, I see all this pink. Mm -hmm. And really, their risk is 15 percent for the average risk woman. Uh, but it doesn't mean, so I consider that to be misinformation, but it doesn't mean that all of the things that we see are permeating into some of the most needy communities. So I spend most of my time working in very poor, very African-American neighborhoods in Chicago, and I do this all the time. And the questions that I get routinely reflect reflect a significant lack of information about resources and education and what is out there in the world. And so we have some populations in our country that may have too much information, mm -hmm. may not be dealing appropriately with the information, and then we have sub-pockets that actually still need more information. Right. And so when we make grand sweeps about what's appropriate for this country, we really need to understand the heterogeneity that exists amongst women, particularly vulnerable women, with access to this information. This is, I think this is such a good point. Rosalind, I, I wanted to talk to you a little, a little bit about mammography, knowing that you'd had the, the genetic testing and then trying to sure. think about sort of how women make choices even about breast self exams, about mammography, and about genetic testing. Right now, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force um, actually recommends against routine screening mammographies in women aged 40 to 49, um, and actually recommends biennial screening mammography for women between 50 and 74, so only every two years. And yet, that may absolutely not be enough if you are someone with a likelihood of getting breast cancer much earlier. Right. Well, one of the things that um, Ornstein's piece sort of reminded me of was the uh, self-breast exam campaign that mm. was launched in my college dormitory freshman year. And uh, in our you know, dormitory communal showers, there was one of those cards that hangs mm -hmm. on the shower head reminding you to do a breast exam in the shower. Um, at 18 years old, uh, women really don't need to be doing self-breast exams. Mm -hmm. um, that year, my mother was dying of breast cancer. The last thing I needed when I took a shower mm -hmm. was to be reminded of my breast cancer risk. Mm -hmm. So there's a sort of perversity of that campaign insofar as the only people who are really responding that cam to that campaign are the people who actually don't need to be reminded, mm. right? So to me, that seems like a sort of a, a waste of resources. Um, I think with mammography uh, and sort of early screening, um, again, 
again, it's a question of using those resources more wisely mm -hmm. and making sure that recommendations are specific and tailored to yeah. the particular woman and her particular medical history. Um, and, you know, in, in that sense, I think one of the problems with some of the Komen campaigns is that it's a sort of a one-size-fits-all slogan. Yeah, uh, you know, that doesn't i got to say, the other problem for me with Komen this year is just the battle that went on between Komen and Planned Parenthood and the idea that Planned Parenthood, I mean, if we're going to talk about resources and we're going to talk about who does and doesn't and have access and the idea that Planned Parenthood provides so much cancer screening for the poorest women that, that when we look at what Planned Parenthood does uh, contraception is a third of it STI tre uh, treatment is about 40 percent of it abortion is only three percent of it and cancer screenings are about 12 percent of what they're up to and then Komen meant to be a, a breast cancer organization chooses not right at least for a moment chose not to give their annual um, money to, to to Planned Parenthood. Well, Komen is a very is a politicized group that has claimed a non-political hmm. mission. Yep. I mean, a, a very interesting point is that Komen does not did not join the lawsuit against Myriad Genetics mm. because Myriad is a donor to Komen. Uh, that was pointed out by Peggy Orenstein right. in a blog post. There's also, um, you know, Breast Cancer Action Group did join the lawsuit. Yep. Uh, they don't accept any sort of corporate sponsorships. One of the reasons Coleman is so powerful is because they have these incredible resources from their corporate partnerships, mm -hmm. but that also restricts them. They were subject to pressure by Republicans. When you talk about also, are, we, are, are is the mammogram, uh, when there were new recommendations from HHS on the mammogram front, Republicans responded by demagoguing it and saying that they were and care. Yep. All of this is deeply political. political. When yep. you think about what Planned Parenthood does also, a, a really important measure of cancer prevention that Planned Parenthood does is give out the HPV vaccine, which is very yep. important for its cervical cancer. That has become demagogued as well with Michelle Bachman claiming yep. it causes quote unquote mental yep. retardation. So again, we, those are actually very preventable diseases and infections that Planned Parenthood works on besides breast cancer, and those are very political. Stay right there. We're going to take a break, but we're going to be right back because I also want to talk about what happens after the diagnosis after uh, the choices and the reconstruction of lives and of breasts when we come back.